Extend your mind, bending the curves of productivity. <clears throat> Consider a typical working session of a couple hours. You set aside the time, silence your phone, and clear your decks, determined to finish some work of real value. We know that time always passes at the same unforgiving pace. And since time costs money, we could graph the two of them together like a linear curve. Now, consider the state of flow that you hope to get into to produce this work of real value. We know that the first stage of the flow is struggle, as your brain situates to the environment and loads the information relevant to the task at hand. So your experience of flow over a couple of hours looks something like it's struggling for the initial 20-30 minutes until you get into a constant state of productivity. Notice how the flow curves dips below the time money curve at the beginning. This is why setting aside a big block of time feels risky. If you're going to spend that much time, you better have something to show for it. Now, let's consider your energy level. This obviously depends on a lot of factors, but it's safe to say that it starts towards the top of the range and ends towards the bottom. Notice where the energy and flow curves intersect. Essentially, your goal in the beginning of the session is to use your high energy to overcome the struggle stage. You're hoping to leap into and climb the cliff of flow before your energy drops too low or time runs out. Now, let's add value created. This is definitely the most uncertain, but I would argue that virtually all the value in the typical individual working session is created at the very end. One minute before you export that design and send it to the client, no value has been created. One minute before you attach your report to an email and send it to your boss with an explanatory note, no value has been created. One minute before your lovingly crafted product has been opened by your customer, no value has been created. The goal of any employee's working session from your employer's point of view is for the value curve to intersect the time slash money curve. If it doesn't, you've spent more time and your company has spent more than the value that was created. If the value created exceeds time slash money, that's what's known as a very productive day. With this simple, if totally unscientific, Graph in hand, we can understand the modern productivity landscape. Every major school of productivity thought can be defined in terms of which curve it attempts to bend and how. The energy school offers a variety of ways to get that energy curve higher. Better diet, more or different exercises, stretching, and yoga, better sleep. If you can just keep your energy level high enough, the argument goes, your productivity will be great. The focus school is all about getting into and staying in flow. Meditation, goal setting, exercises, prioritizing schemes, avoiding distractions, no meeting or no phone days, accountability mechanisms, noise cancelling headphones and many others. They argue that the best strategy is to pick a task and then hammer away at it until it's finished, extending that flow curve for as long as possible. The efficiency school is obsessed with the logistics of work. It advocates using technology or other people to automate tasks, learning keyboard shortcuts, improving reading and writing speed, ruthlessly cutting out all the unnecessary activities, moving to Bali to cut down expenses and other methods of cramming more productivity into the given amount of time 
and money represented by the time money curve. Now, watch what happens when we don't have a big block of time to set aside or that block of time gets interrupted. In other words, the typical situation faced by mo- most workers on most days. Breaking our day into smaller segments has no effect on the time slash money sent. spent. You are paid a fixed amount of time to be there a certain number of hours regardless of how they are divided up. And there isn't much effect on the energy curve either. You are still tired at the end of the day, so no matter how many or how few sessions you've had, it's still the same. The real impact of breaking up the day into smaller segments is on the flow or lack thereof. Since we don't have enough time in one stretch to get into flow, we spend most of our day in struggle. We feel as if we are interrupted from the current interruption by yet another interruption. This is how you can work hard all day, yet walk away with the distinct impression you didn't get anything done. Here's a radical idea. What if this new workplace environment we find ourselves in is actually a good thing? What if we saw the constant stimulation not as interruptions and distractions but as opportunity for rich feedback and connection? What if we use online networks as platforms for learning and collaboration and not as procrastination devices? In other words, instead of fighting the direction the world is moving, drinking more coffee, cutting off our access to technology and trying to force ourselves to focus, wouldn't it be easier to flow with it or possibly even use it to our advantage? I'd like to start a new school of productivity, the value school. Its objective will be to shift the curve that usually usually gets taken for granted, the value created curve. What we need to do is change the shape and size of the value curve to match the pace at which modern work moves. Instead of delivering value in a big package that spans huge amounts of time, we deliver it in smaller chunks at more frequent intervals. This idea, of course, isn't new. In the world of manufacturing, it is the equivalent of small batch sizes, a key part of just-in-time vision that has propelled Toyota through seven decades of growth to become the world's largest automaker. In the world of software, it is known as continuous integration and deployment, a practice that has revolutionized the speed and quality with which software we use every day is developed. In the startup world, Eric Ries has shown us in his book, The Lean Startup, how delivering value quickly in small chunks is essential for learning and innovation. But we lack a framework for how individual employees can use small batch sizes to their advantage. Each worker in this new economy really is a startup of one. Wouldn't it make sense for us to use the same approach that has revolutionized manufacturing, software development, and startups? What is keeping us from realizing this vision? I believe is a mistaken assumption. This assumption is revealed when we ask the question, what is the inventory of knowledge work? What is the information age equivalent to the raw materials that flow through a factory? The typical response is that tasks are the inventory of knowledge work. Many productivity strategies, like Kanban boards, set limits on work in progress inventory by limiting the number of open tasks that are allowed to be worked on at any given time. Focus on one thing at a time, we are told. But tasks are not Inventory, they are nothing but abstract units of organization. No company sells their talks to customers and no employer will pay you for a completed to-do list. The inventory of knowledge work is ideas. What you are selling 
as a worker of knowledge are the ideas you've processed through the focused application of your attention. I think this makes people uncomfortable because ideas are hard to quantify. We often hear that ideas are cheap, only executions matter. Thus feel more comfortable in the execution of tasks than the generation of new ideas. Tasks are simpler, with only two possible states, done and undone. Whereas ideas exist on a much murkier spectrum of grays. Even our job titles designate certain people as creatives, with the rest presently not expected to have any ideas. If ideas are the inventory of knowledge work, then reducing our bad sizes requires changing not how we manage tasks and projects, but how we manage the information content of those projects. We need to change our conception of what we are producing from final deliverables to what I call intermediate packets. Instead of seeing the final product, the deliverable we sell to the client, as the only repository of value, we package up all the intermediate steps, the research, the notes, the brainstorms, the examples, outlines, prototypes, drafts, and even crazy, crazy ideas we choose not to pursue as reusable components for later consumption. At the end of the project, instead of making one final crazy all-night push to load every single part of the project into our brain for final delivery, our task is easier final assembly of previously built packets. This approach has numerous benefits. Number one, create value in any span of time. If we see our work as creating these intermediate packets, we can find ways to create value in any span of time. No matter how short, productivity becomes a game of matching each available block of time with a corresponding packet of value. Actually finishing things is critical to our motivation and morale. Why not redefine our work in smaller units and give us this feeling of completion at a more consistent pace? Two, projects become less intimidating. Big ambitious projects are risky because all the time you've spent on it will feel like a waste if you don't succeed. Often, we don't even attempt the big ones because the path from here to there seems impossibly long and unclear. But if your only goal is to create an intermediate packet and show it to someone, good notes on a book, a Pinterest board of design inspirations, just one module of code, then you can trick yourself into getting started. And even if that particular big project doesn't pan out, you'll still have the value of packets at your disposal. Three, become interruption-proof. While organizing your work in intermediate packets has an extraordinary effect, you become interruption-proof because you rarely even try to load the entire project into your mind at once. Once there isn't much to lose if someone taps you on the shoulder, you can even start to see interruptions as a good thing. They remind you not to take on too much at once, to check in with others, to clear your mind, and take a break once in a while. Four, get better feedback. Another impact of breaking up your work into smaller chunks is that you can stop and more often to get feedback. This is a critical skill as the pace of change in marketplace accelerates. This is because the part of packaging up of intermediate packet is that it becomes legible. Others can get a sense of what it is and what it means, unlike your 25 pages of messy notes in a Google Doc. People are more willing to give honest feedback on something that is merely a work in progress, whereas they're hesitant to critique something that looks highly polished. Five, create a productively flywheel. After you've been working this way for a while, there is a final benefit. You gain the ability to complete entire projects merely by assembling previously built packets. There seems to be a critical mass in a given industry or area. Once you reach that mass, 
each additional packet added creates exponential value in the connection it creates with others. There is the mythical productivity flywheel, a system that produces value with almost on its own, while you take a back seat as the curator. Manager and gatekeeper. So, what is required to make this new approach a reality? It requires us to get much, much better at packaging our work midstream. Here's what makes it difficult. We can't afford to do this packaging during the project because every spare moment that is needed to race towards the deadline. And we can't do it after the project ends because by then we are already off to the next one. No, this packaging has to be embedded into the actual way we work moment to moment so that it doesn't take any extra time whatsoever. There is a need for a new way of defining packaging and delivering knowledge work and that's why I believe the humble category of note-taking apps represents the next frontier of productivity. Their purpose is much different from file storage services like Box, Dropbox, and iCloud, as well as cloud-based suits like Google Drive and Microsoft 360. They don't optimize for finished products ready to be printed or for convenient groupings of project files or storage space or speed or collaboration of any other things that one could optimize for. Instead, they optimize for productive randomness for serendipity, for seemingly bizarre juxtapositions of apparently unconnected information to train our capacity for connecting it. Each person processes a unique live stream of information from numerous sources and success increasingly depends on curating, tweaking, redirecting and capturing value from the stream to use it in our work. Instead of hiding our insights and learning in neatly labeled folders and files, we want to expose them as intermediate packets of ever-evolving intermediate work. Note-taking apps, simply put, are our best option for bending productivity to the ebb and flows of our days and for managing the work in progress inventory of ideas that represents our biggest assets as knowledge workers.